So we will start soon the oral session of this afternoon. So for the first talk, we have a Nikita who will talk about uh, stability bound. Yes. So the floor is yours. You well, okay. Um. Yeah, so while um, everything is prepared, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for giving me this opportunity, especially the fact that I'm giving a 25 minutes talk, while tomorrow, if you're attending New Rips uh, virtually, it will be only a 15 minutes talk. So it's an extended free uh, version. So it's called Stability and Deviation Optimal Risk Bounds with Convergence Rate uh, 1 over n. Uh, I'm Nikita Zhivatovsky from ETH, and it's a joint work with uh, my colleague Igor Klechkov, who is a postdoc at the University of Cambridge. So let me start. Um, so I, I'll be interested in two most basic questions, uh, like about generalization. So we're all interested in when uh, uh, the learning algorithms generalize. And uh, a, a related question is when is the test error close to empirical error? So if you are minimized empirical error, it's good that I also minimize the test error somehow. Okay, let's go through some history. And uh, one of the first ideas, actually, before even before uniform convergence, that was used to analyze uh, the, the generalization ability of learning algorithms was uh, stability. So it appears as early as in 1974 book by Vapnik and Chervalenkis, and the stability is the following thing. It's a low sensitivity of the learning algorithm to changes in just one learning example. So we have many points, but I want to perturb just one. Okay, so the simplest idea that was used is by, uh, again, by Vapnik and Chervalenkis. So if you consider like two class uh, like classification, pluses and minuses, blues and green points, and then you have this classifier that maximizes the margin, you know that only these support vectors, so the three, three vectors that are closest to the margin, they really affect the separating hypersp uh, hyperspace, and removing everything else doesn't change anything. So it's the same algorithm. So in some sense, algorithm has low sensitivity to changes in these points. By change here, I mean removal. And these two facts, so the fact that I, I'm not sensitive to many changes, like there are only three points, and the fact that I'm perfectly separating these points is enough to prove generalization. So that's how the first bounds were proven. So in general, uh, stability is used as follows. Like if I have stability, yeah, so low sensitivity to changes, and lo a low empirical error, then I imply the low test error. So all the results on stability are of this sort. Like I use two to imply the third. So one, uh, another example on stability is uh, uh, the classic like ridge regression. So I'm minimizing the empirical error and I have a ridge penalty. So let's consider two uh, different modes. Like if I send lambda to plus infinity, then of course the only output which is reasonable is zero. So it's a solution that is very, very stable. It doesn't, it's not affected by my samples, yeah, by any, points in my learning sample. At the same time, it doesn't fit the data very well, yeah? So another extreme is that when I have no penalty, no reach, then I fit the data much better, but my stability is worse because I'm more sensitive to like points appearing in my sample. And in general, the best generalization bounds, for example, for reach, I usually come in from the so-called fitting stability trade-off. So one of the things how you, <coughs> one of the approaches how you may think of it is when you choose lambda so that the, your solution is stable enough, so it's not very sensitive to changes, and at the same time it feels uh, it <coughs> fits the data quite well. So this is the general principle, um, and uh, the formal definition that I'm using here is called a uniform stability. So this is one of the most classical. So let me uh, introduce any. Uh, learning algorithm AS, so it's A train on the sample S, and we have its true risk, so an analog of a test error, and empirical risk, yeah? So any loss function and any classifier F. And then let me define SI, it's an example where I replace XI, YI by some XI prime, Y prime, just a single point, and I'm saying that the un algorithm is uniformly stable with parameter gamma, so gamma is like something general. It can depend on the sample size, on complexity, on whatever. It's like something that will be, everything will be a function of gamma, such that the following holds. The loss of my algorithm trained on the original sample and tested on any point x, y, minus the loss of the same algorithm, which is trained on s with i being removed from it, or like changed, sorry, changed by x, i, y prime. So I change one sample, but test on the same x, i pair. Uh, doesn't change much, so it's at most 
uh, it changes by its most gamma for any sample, for any sample with change point, and any test point XI. So there are some good examples. So again, it's uh, like ridge regression, you can think of it as like under some boundedness assumptions, like soft margin SVM, so it's like from Bousquet, Elisave, Safe 2002, it's a famous paper. But most recently, people study this uniform stability because of this paper uh, by Hart, Recht, and Singer, 2016. They're analyzing the stability of the gradient descent methods. And the idea is this is quite simple. If you start uh, gradient descent, yes, uh, like if you start with some initialization, then you're very stable because you haven't used your data so far. You just have a fixed solution, which is very stable, but it doesn't feel fit the data very well. At the same time, when you do these gradient descent steps, you fit the data better, but you lose some stability. And the somewhere, like the uh, stopping rule, is when your stability and like fitting properties lay of the same order. Yeah? And of course, another interest coming from the connections with differential privacy. It's a, like a special case of differential privacy. Now, if we go to theories, then uh, until recently, the state-of-the-art result was, uh, again, from this 2002 paper by Bousquet and Safe, and it's saying the following, that if I have a, a uniformly stable algorithm with parameter gamma, my loss is bounded by L, then with high probability, the following holds. Risk of the algorithm, so it's like my test error, minus the empirical error, is less or equal than gamma square root n in this tail term, plus L square root log n, uh, 1 over delta over n. So this is a sampling error in some sense. Okay, there are two parts. The first one is responsible to how stable I am, and the second is responsible to, like, you know, to the sampling error in some sense, because it will appear even if I'm super stable, if gamma is zero. So it's how, uh, like, it appears usually in Hebdings inequality. Now, the problem with this classical bound, and it, 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 like, it didn't bother many people for uh, 15 years, I think, uh, is that there is a square root n term which is multiplicative. So it means that as the sample size grows, this term is getting larger and larger, but we expect that as the sample size grows, we, you know, we generalize better and better. So it's some kind of a contradiction. But the problem comes from the fact that the analysis, so it's a problem of analysis mainly, it was very, very naive. So it, the proof only follows from this so-called like, uh, bounded difference in equality, and it's a simple algebra, and then you get uh, this result. It's in many textbooks now. now um, very recently, there was an interest coming from the field mostly working on differential privacy, actually, because they understood that something is not correct with this bound. It shouldn't scale with square root n, so it, it, it should scale much better. And uh, there are two, like, I, can, I would say, like breakthrough papers by uh, Vitaly Feldman and Jan Wondrak uh, that were first to move, like, uh, to improve these bounds, and more recently, uh, it's like a prerequisite to this new RIPS paper. We were able to kind of completely also eliminate this square root n factor and also some extra log factor. So what we proved under the same assumptions, if I have an algorithm that is uniformly stable, like anything for which I can uh, measure the stability, again, the stability is a sensitivity to changes in one learning sample, and my loss is bounded by L, then the algorithm satisfies the following generalization bound. The risk of the algorithm minus the empirical risk is less recall than, again, two terms. The one is scaling proportional to gamma, yeah. So it's like stability. There, you see, there is no square root n anymore. It's not just growing. It's growing, but very slowly. So there's there is only this like small log n term. And then there is again a sampling error, which is l square log one over delta uh, over n. So if you know this general like learning theory from books, then in some sense we know how to prove these bounds using. Uh, like Redemacher complexity, yes, uniform convergence. When you have ERM, empirical risk minimizer, in a certain class, and usually you have two terms, one responsible for some complexity and the other for some sampling or tail. So this is a similar thing, but instead of using the complexity of the class, like how complex my decision space is, I'm just using how stable my algorithm is, and I'm getting the same or bounds of the same form in some sense. I don't, I'm not worried how complex the class of output, how many parameters there are, etc. So there is, as you see, there is no com uh, dependence on the complexity of the function space. And uh, the proof, I'll just um, give you a few words. So it's very important to work not with tails, but with some moments of random variables. So this like LP norm of the random variable. And if we are able to prove a certain random variable, in, in our case, it's an excess risk, the moment bounds of this form, like it's the, the, the LP norm scales as say square root P plus P up to some constants A and B, then you can always uh, translate it into a high probability bound. And uh, the classical bounded difference inequality that was used in the previous proofs uh, is exactly uh, the result of the following form. So if, if I have a function J 
of n variables uh, such that changing at most one variable like out of n in it changes its value by at most beta implies that I can control the moments of like you know, or the tails in some sense or like the concentration of this function of n independent random variables around its mean. So if I have n independent random variables and if the function satisfies the bounded difference inequality or property, oh sorry, property, then I can control the moments of this uh, difference, which is similar to ha controlling the tails, uh, how far my value, how far my random variable is from its expectation. And this is the trick that was used in this Bousquet and Yelly Safe paper in 2002. However, more recently, uh, we, need, we understood that this inequality is not enough and you need a more, uh, like more advanced version of it. So the more advanced version, I'll just provide it for reference because it's a working like in a horse of all these uh, bounds that I'm presenting uh, here. It's the following generalization of the bounded difference inequality, but it works as follows. Instead of considering how the functions of independent random variables uh, concentrate around their means, I want to understand how the, f the sums of functions of ind independent vari random variables uh, like concentrate around their means. So it's, it's so slightly more involved, but that is, this is exactly what's happening in uniformly stable algorithms. So this is, uh, this abstract statement, maybe I w wouldn't, wouldn't spend any time on it, but this is exactly the mathematical kind of core or how this stable algorithm should be analyzed. So we make certain uh, bounded difference type assumptions on each function, they depend, there are n of them, they depend on the same uh, independent random variables, and then I control the properly the LP norm of the sum of these functions. And then plugging in the proper, like the, the correctly chosen functions GI will imply these generalization bounds. Okay, this was like uh, some kind of a prerequisite, and now I'm ready to present you some really new results. So the idea is that the state-of-the-art bound, like this 2020, has two terms. Again, stability term, yeah, so in ingenization, and the sampling error. So the sampling error, as I told you, it appears even if gamma is zero. So I'm super stable, I'm, I'm super naive, and always output the same solution. I'll pay this because I pay for like Hovding's inequality in some sense. And the idea is that if gamma say one over n, so I'm very stable, then I don't get anything here because this term is one over n, but this term is one over square root of n, so it's bad. And the question is, can I sharpen the sampling error? And can I like, prove hyperability one over n excess risk bounds using stability? So this was like completely unknown. And uh, one of the results uh, that we got, we actually can use really get some uh, bounds that, uh, you know, benefit from having a small risk or like small empirical risk of the algorithm and completely eliminate this one over square root of n term in some cases. So the idea is the following, that the same with some more effort, the same result for stability can be improved to get the following bound. That if I have a uniformly stable algorithm with parameter gamma, then I can prove that the empirical, the risk of the algorithm, like a test risk uh, on the test sample in some sense, minus the empirical thing that I can minimize actually, consists of two, three terms. The one term um, relates to stability, it's the same gamma log n. So then I have a term which has a square root of the risk of my algorithm. So in, imagine you can think of risk or empirical risk. So if my empirical risk is zero, so we have fear, really start fitting the data, yes, and I expect that my risk is will also like, get smaller and smaller, then this term will just uh, disappear, so it can be sm quite small. And the only term that's left is this one over n sampling, which is very fast, so that's uh, the main message. And the proof is actually surprisingly involved, so it requires a few techniques. So the first one is this uh, moment inequality that we used, then we need to apply it to a certain specifically chosen function. Then we need the Bernstein moment inequality, a version of the Bernstein inequality to control these certain residuals. And then we need a second order concentration, so it's like a weakly self-bounded functions, uh, in order to get this risk under, it's a random variable, yeah? It's a r risk of a rule trained on a random sample under this uh, square root. Yeah, but it, it's like kind of, you know, state of the art for uh, uniform stability. And uh, as I told you, we can also prove that uh, the, the same bound, where instead of having a small true risk here, I'm having a small empirical risk here. And again, if it's small, then this term is eliminated, and I have like gamma plus one over n, and everything with hyperability. Okay, so it's a first application. The second application is also super classical. 
for those of you who work uh, like on uh, convex optimization. So I have a uh, general stochastic convex optimization setup. I have a certain loss function, and I have a um, W is a bounded convex domain in the Hilbert space. So yeah, the importance is that I don't uh, I, I don't know the dimension. So it may, it may be like there may be many many parameters that encode my uh, space. So I have a strongly convex loss. So this is a, uh, one of the classical definitions from stochastic convex optimization. And I assume that it's point-wise Lipschitz. So I assume this property. And again, I can define the risk and the empirical risk of with respect to this new loss. Now. Uh, the idea is that um, we can prove that the empirical risk minimizer in stochastic convex optimization, like strongly convex losses, achieves this very neat and short bound, so that uh, if you minimize the empirical loss, it's the loss is strongly convex and Lipschitz, then with high probability, it's L squared and gamma, uh, lambda, log n, log 1 over delta. So it's a high probability upper bound. So the important thing always is that I don't pay dimension, yeah? So in some sense, uh, this example is important because it's known for like maybe 13 years already. And this is exactly the type of kind of learning theory when we prove generalization without having any uniform convergence. So the class is, has an infinite dimension, so they, you cannot like uh, control cov nice covering numbers, fat shattering dimensions, so they're all kind of quite bad. But stability sh helps us a lot. So again, the importance of this example is because of this. So I, have, I can have like kind of over parameterization. Then the second thing, nice thing is that it's, it was really open for some time. So it's like from the paper called Stochastic Convex Optimization by these authors. So they asked if this such a bound is possible. Uh, fortunately, with these modern techniques, we were able to solve it. And uh, the interesting part is that we, c we really kind of build a more general learning theory type thing when we can get log n over n convergence rate instead of having like uniform uh, convergence or Rademacher complexity type bounds, we um, use stability plus the Bernstein assumption. So it's a for some of you, it's like a typical assumption to prove one over n rates uh, in statistical learning. So no uniform convergence used again. Um, let me give you one like practical, uh, not a practical example, but one real example, which again, somehow was not no one or people like you know, we didn't have enough techniques uh, to prove these simple things until recently. So imagine that I just want to play a simple game. I want uh, to get an accessories bound, like a generalization bound, and uh, I want to combine like both some optimization part where I minimize the empirical error, say, and to, to really say something about the test error. So it's like a you know, really it's, it's a real kind of um, um, real game between optimization and generalization. Yeah. Oh, and statistics, say. So I'm using like the standard projected uh, gradient descent, and I, I'm using a very naive thing. I just uh, uh, observe the empirical loss of my samples, and I just uh, run like a projected gradient descent on the empirical loss. So it's not like a like you know single batch or something like that, or SGD. It's like a super naive GD on the empirical loss. And the idea is the following: if I have a loss function that is strongly convex and Lipschitz. And I choose my weights, like uh, accord in, in this PGD, according to a certain law, and run uh, projected gradient descent on the empirical loss, like uh, without any batching, etc. Then the following holds: if I have, like, say, t n squared uh, iterate, so it's quite a lot, but still, uh, then with high probability, so you know, you can prove that you will approximate your uh, empirical error will be quite small then we can prove that you are stable enough, and then you can plug it in in our genization bound. So we control both stability, empirical error of SGD after a certain amount of steps, and we really prove generalization. So the, idea, the nice thing is that it's really the comparison of the true risk of my function minus the risk of the best function like in this set, but uh, everything, like you know, the st the optimization was like only with respect to the empirical measure. So it was a really uh, g the gradient descent uh, on the empirical loss. Of course, you may uh, say that this is too much, but this is what appears from the analysis. So if we assume, for example, uh, that <coughs> my loss is smooth, then uh, again using the standard techniques from um, like uh, convex optimization, after a relatively small number of iterations, so it's like logarithmic in n. I achieve uh, a desired like level of uh, empirical error, then I prove that I have enough stability, and this implies uh, generalization. Not only optimization errors controlled, but really 
uh, the generalization. So, and then a short take home uh, message. I think I'm almost done. So, we can prove uh, 1 over square root n and 1 over n high probability generalization bounds. So, high probability is one of important uh, contributions here. Uh, bounds using uniform stability instead of anything like classical. So, in, in people use like Rademacher complexity, uniform convergence, etc. So, nothing. Only you, the stability of the algorithm is computed and an analyzed. And in some cases, what is interesting is that it gives you high probability generalization bounds, even though we know that there is no uniform convergence. So the example of, uh, sorry, the stochastic convex optimization example is a classical thing, that we don't have uniform convergence, but only controlling these Lipschitz constants and um, like lambda, we can get dimension-free bounds. Okay, I, I think I will stop here. Thank you very much for attention. Uh, Do you have any question for Nikita? So you still have this log n? Yes. Do you think it's uh, it should be there? Or? Um, yeah, we tried a lot, and uh, we don't know how to remove this log. Uh, we we believe think that it should, it should be? be no, it should not be there. Okay. Yeah, but then up to log, the bound on, for example, for the stochastic convex optimization, it's like sharp. You can prove it. So it's like log one. Over, uh, all the parameters are captured correctly, except this log. So this log works, uh, like, you know, appears in the proof technique, inevitably, uh, in our proof technique. So there might be a different proof technique, but it seems quite uh, hard, yeah. For lower moments, for in expectation bounds, or like second moments of the excess risk, we know how to remove the log. But for if you really need a tail, if you really need high probability bound, unfortunately we don't know. So it's a it's a good question actually. Thanks. Thanks. Any other question? No, no. Okay. So thanks again, Nikita. It was very, very, very nice talk. We have a technical problem, so maybe I will sing a song. <laughs> so you sing in B. <laughs> okay, uh, I will try to to, uh, to win time. Uh, first of all, okay, uh, thank you for your talk. It was amazing. I uh, really like it. I've been complaining about Rademacher complexity all the time. So <laughs> exactly, that's great. <laughs> great work. It's in one direction. It's on one two. Oops, one, two, that's working. Um, before everyone leaves for the final, uh, um, you're good? Okay, good. <laughs> and so nice weather for the season, huh? <laughs> Did you notice? Uh, so anyway, we are still left a little bit of, um, we, we still have some goodies. So if you didn't get your own uh, mug for the NERIPS event, we still have some left uh, at the reception uh, outside, so. Please don't leave any. And uh, well, that's a good timing. Okay, so the last <laughs> talk of the day will be uh, by uh, Raphael Berthier, and I'm uh, uh, well, you know, the title is here, and he will tell us what it's all about. But um, since it is the last talk, I think we should all uh, congratulate Raphael because this paper received outstanding paper award this year in in the RIPS. So congratulations. <laughs> And we have also one of the organizers in it. <laughs> so it's a pleasure, Raphael. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Florent. Um, OK, thank you for the introduction. Nice uh, improvisation. And, um, and so thank you for organizing this event, Florent Lenka and Nicolas. This is very nice. Um, so I'm going to present uh, our paper on the continuized acceleration and its work with a bunch of people. So in the order of the picture, we have uh, Mathieu. Uh, Flor uh, not Florent, Francis, Nicola, <laughs> there's still, uh, still room. Pierre, uh, Adrian, uh, Laurent, and Adrian. And so at the time where we did this project, it was mostly people uh, in, in Ria in Paris, a little bit here at EPFL, and a little bit in Grenoble. Okay. 
So it's a paper on continuized acceleration. So what is this? It's a technique to create accelerated algorithms in optimization. And this technique, you can use it in different settings. So in the paper, we give a list of settings where it works. So we use it to build a variant of Nesterov acceleration. So this is acceleration in a classical setting with deterministic gradients. But we are also interested in accelerating using stochastic gradient. Um, we are also interested in accelerating in decentralized schemes. So for instance, we, we work on randomized gossip and distributed optimization. But today, I want to present only the materials in blue. So nested of acceleration for the, in the strongly convex case and randomized gossip. And I think that from this, you will be able to extrapolate uh, the technique to new situations. Um, but before I get to these two examples, let me give you a high-level introduction on uh, what is this technique. So the idea is the following. Um, many accelerated algorithms in optimization, they are, uh, they are expressed as discrete iteration. So you define a new iterate xn plus 1 from the current iterate xn, the gradient of your function at xn, and the previous iterate xn minus 1. And the advantage of having such an iteration is that you can directly implement this into your computer. But many accelerated algorithms are hard to treat and to analyze. And this is very well known for Nesterov acceleration. Many people think that it's a little bit mysterious because basically, if you want to understand it, you take a look at the magic in the proof. And this is not the most satisfying way to understand things. So people have suggested to take a continuous time point of view on these algorithms. The idea is that in a way or in another, or another you will take a continuous, continuous time limit of your algorithm for instance, by taking step sizes that go to zero. And this continuous time limit, you will, uh, it will be easier to intuit and easier to analyze. But there is a problem. If you want to implement this continuous time limit, it will typically be like an ODE with a gradient flow. You cannot implement an ODE. You have to discretize it. If you discretize it, there will be some discretization error. And in these situations, it's hard to control the discretization error you will typically lose the theoretical guarantees when you discretize. So there are uh, problems on both sides. And today, we'd like to present something in between that have some of the advantages of both sides. And we call that the continuous framework. The idea is that you have a continuous time. And you can use this continuous time to design algorithm and to analyze them. But the algorithm that you will create through this process will be directly implementable exactly. There is a drawback, though. It is that we'll, we will randomize the algorithms. OK, so this is a bit very abstract and high level. So maybe it's, it's good if I get to an example now. And so I will start with a case of Nesterov acceleration. And it's a good example because it's, a, it's very classical in optimization. It's a bit uh, minimal in some sense. So first, reminders about Nesterov acceleration. Uh, what is the setting? We want to minimize a convex function, f of x, on Rd. We want to find the minimum x star, and we assume, for instance, that it's half smooth and mu strongly convex. In that setting, Nesterov proposed the following iteration. As I said, it's not very easy to intuit what it does, but we can still make a few remarks. First, there are three iterates, xk, yk, and zk. At each iteration, um, the, the, the equation takes linear combinations of the variables, and they take gradient steps. Gradient steps always with respect to the same variable yk. Again, the magic lies in the proof. Nesterov showed the following result. The excess error f of yk minus f of x star decays exponentially, or in the community you might want to say linearly, in a typical time which is the square root of the condition number. And this square root was showing that we had acceleration. OK, so this is Nesterov acceleration. What would be the continuized version of Nesterov acceleration? So as I said, now we will take a continuous time, continuous time t. And on this continuous time, you take a Poisson clock. What is a Poisson clock? It's a sequence of numbers such that intervals between those numbers are random, independent, and exponential of rate 1. 
So it will give you something like this. And now you will define two variables, xt and zt, indexed by this continuous time. And they evolve as follows. So they, are, they, will, con they, will, they will involve continuously between time ticks, and they will take jumps at the clock ticks. So at the clock ticks, you take gradient steps. So you define x of tk, x just after the clock tick, as a gradient step from x just before the clock tick. And this I will de denote x tk minus. So this is just this equation, a gradient step. Z uh, follows a similar behavior at tk. So z tk is z tk minus minus a gradient. But here you take the gradient, the gradient at x tk minus. This is a bit weird, but it is like this. Between the clock ticks, you have a classical ODE. The two variables attract one another. So the derivative of xt with respect to time is proportional to zt minus xt. And so this is a random process. And for this random process, we can show a result that is very similar to the result of Nesterov. So now it's a, it's a random process. So we have to control a random quantity. We, we, we control the expectation, but we show that the expectation of the excess error decays exponentially in a typical time, which is the square root of a condition number. So it's a very similar theoretical guarantee. So now you will ask, why is this more interesting than, than the original uh, iteration of Nesterov? Three reasons. First, there is a similar concept in Markov chain theory. So a Markov chain is a sequence of random jumps at, uh, at discrete times. And in Markov chain theory, people introduce the continuous Markov chain, which is a continuous time process that takes the same random jumps, but at the ticks of a Poisson clock. It's the same idea. And people like this continuized Markov chain because it's easier to analyze and it has properties that are very similar to the original uh, Markov chain. Okay, so similar idea, and this is why we chose the name of continuized acceleration for our uh, acceleration. Um, so second, um, you know that in order to achieve acceleration, you need in a way or another to alternate between gradient steps and combine linearly variables. And the continuized technique is a way to do this randomly. So if you take an infinitesimal uh, uh, time interval between t and t plus dt, you choose randomly whether there will be a clock tick or not in this interval. If there is a clock tick, you take grand steps. If there is no clock tick, you just mix the variables. And in general, in math, it's easier to analyze processes that alternate randomly rather than in cycles. So this is what, in a way, this is what we do here. And this statement, you know it already, okay? If you want to analyze stochastic grain descent, you prefer to sample functions randomly rather than in cycles. If you want to do coordinate grain descent, you prefer to sample coordinates randomly rather than in cycles. It's just another way to do this. And the first, third reason, and we will get to this at the end of this talk, is that continuized acceleration are well suited uh, in decentralized schemes. And so this will become clear in the following. But before that, let me return uh, to the continuized acceleration. And so I told you that it was possible to implement the continuized uh, process exactly. Why? The idea is to discretize the process at the ticks of the Poisson clock. So it's a random discretization. You define xk tilde as xt at the tick tk, yk tilde at xt just before the tick tk plus 1, and zk tilde as zt at the tick tk. And then you get these equations. These are closed recurrence relations, which means you can actually implement this. And it is the same as Nesterov acceleration. Actually, not really. It has the same shape as Nesterov acceleration, but the coefficients changed. Before, they were deterministic. Now they are randomized, because they depend on the ticks of the Poisson clock. So in the end, if you don't look at the details, you can say, OK, we have only randomized the coefficients of Nesterov acceleration. 
But thanks to this, we now have a continuous time point of view, which may help you to design algorithms and to analyze them. So this finishes my first part on uh, nested of acceleration. First example. And now I want to give a totally different example about randomized gossip. Okay? And this is going to be a, a, a quite a different story. And so I'm going to start the story of gossip algorithms uh, from scratch. So even if you don't know anything about gossip algorithm, uh, it will be fine. The gossip problem is a toy problem of decentralized computing defined as follows. So you have a you have a network of agents and communication links between them. And to each one of your nodes, you give it a real number. And you want to compute the average of these numbers. So all nodes in the graph would like to know the average of the initial values. The hard part is that you can use only pairwise communication links in order to do this. So what you can do, for instance, is every time an edge is activated, the two nodes that can communicate, they share their values, and they replace their current estimation of the average by the average of the two values. And you can imagine that if you repeat that for many edge activations, actually, everyone will converge to a common value, which will be the, the global average of the initial values. This algorithm is called the simple gossip algorithm because it's very naive. And the question raised by the gossip community is, can you do faster? Can you change? this update rule here in order to accelerate, to converge faster to the average. Okay, so I need to define a little bit mathematically what I'm doing. So I'm taking a graph G, so my network is just a graph for me, a set of nodes V and a set of edges E, I will assume that it's connected. Uh, for me, values held by the nodes, it will be a function of the nodes, so the initial values is a function x0 of the nodes, and I want to compute the average x bar of the values of x0. And now I need a model for my communications. So I will assume that my environment is random. So I will take a Poisson clock for the edge activations. And at each tick of a Poisson clock, I sample randomly, uniformly an edge in my graph. And this is the edge that it can communicate. So in the simple gossip algorithm, every time there is an edge activation which is random at the tick of a Poisson clock, I just average my current estimate xt at the nodes, at the, at the ends of this edge, uh, by taking uh, so the average of the two previous values. And so this is a local computation. If, new, if u is not an, ed, an end of this edge, then there is no update. Okay. And so in order to be able to do something, I need to make a link with what I said before. What is the relationship with optimization? So the relationship is the following. Uh, if you have a distribution of values in your graph, so a function from the nodes to the real numbers, you can define an energy of this configuration. The energy f of x is the sum of the square differences along the edges of, a, of, well, of it's the sum along the edges of a square difference between the values held at the ends of this edge. This equation, I'm trying to, to read it. <laughs> and so it's a finite sum. And let's see what happens if you apply stochastic gradient descent on this finite sum. So if you apply stochastic gradient descent, you're sampling randomly a function. You're sampling randomly an edge in your graph. And then you take a gradient step on this function one element of a finite sum. It has only two coordinates active that are x of v and x of w. All the other coordinates, they do not matter. And so if you take a grand step, first, the coordinates x of u that are different from v and w, they do not change. And simple computation, if you take a grand step with step size 1 half, the two values x of v and x of w, they are replaced by their average. So you're starting to feel where, where I'm getting at. The simple gossip algorithm that I've shown to you before, it is just stochastic gradient descent on this energy function with step size one half. So it's stochastic gradient descent, but it's a bit special because the updates are not in discrete time, they are at the ticks of a Poisson clock. So it is this equation, xtk is a gradient step, a stochastic gradient step away from xtk minus. And so still, 
you can think, okay, I have a process which is equivalent to stochastic gradient descent. Can I use any acceleration of stochastic gradient descent in order to accelerate this process? It turns out that it's not that simple. Why? Because in order to achieve acceleration, you need to mix two things. You need to mix gradient steps with linear combinations of the variables. This would be, for instance, this is just an example. This would be a stochastic heavy ball, typically. And this is a local computation. So this is, you need only the neighbors of the edge to do this computation. But this is not a local computation. All nodes need to do something. And here you have an asynchrony problem. Every time one edge is activated in the graph, you need all nodes to do a computation in order to implement this equation. But in a, in a decentralized setting, you cannot do this. There is no global counter of edge activations. And so this is not a feasible uh, acceleration scheme. It turns out that continuized uh, acceleration schemes are what you are looking for. So do not take a look in too much detail on the equation, but they are very similar to those that you have seen before. In a continuized acceleration, you take grand steps at the clock ticks, but grand steps are local computation. And just as time goes, you mix the variables, you take linear combination. But in order to implement this, you don't need a global counter of edge activations. You just need a global notion of time flow. And this is a really uh, reasonable assumption. And so for this acceleration that you can implement, we showed an accelerated rate of convergence of the estimates xt of v to the average in a typical time, which is uh, the square root of uh, the inverse of a strong convexity parameter of the energy function. It's just uh, for the gossip community, this meant this square root meant acceleration. So, um, to conclude, I've given, I've given two examples of a continuized technique. And let me say that the motivation in both examples were really different. In the second example, um, the problem was inherently continuized, meaning that we had the problem naturally defined at the ticks of a Poisson clock, and we had to deal with this Poisson clock, deal with this randomness. And this is why we needed uh, the continuized technique to deal with asynchrony. It was not the case in the first example. In order to minimize strongly convex function, we had an of acceleration that perfectly did the job before. In the first example, the point was only to give a different perspective on Nestor of acceleration. And so this is a more subjective point of view, and I'll leave it up to you to decide whether it was worth it or not. To conclude, let me thank my collaborators again, and thank you for your attention. Any question from the audience? Don't be shy. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, can you come back on the first algorithm, your, your uh, continuized uh, Nesterov? <laughs> yes. Um, my question is, um, what happens if you change the parameter of the distribution of the, the exponential uh, uh, distribution? So you want to change the rate or really the yeah, low? The, the rate, the yes. So if you change the rate, it's, it's not a big problem. So you will have to update the parameters, but it will amount to a time rescaling. And so this, you can adapt VOD so that it's uh, coherent. Why did we choose rate one? Because uh, with a rate one, the number of grain steps that you will make, the number of grain computations that you will make, on a long time t, it will be roughly t by the, the law of large numbers. And so we wanted this time t to be proportional to the complexity to, in order to make both algorithms uh, comparable. But let me say that if you change the law, you, you, you deviate from the exponential, then your process is not uh, memoryless, and then the analysis would get much, much harder. And in that case, uh, I cannot claim anything. But 
um, but so if I, I take a much smaller, um, uh, yeah, a much larger rate, so much more time steps, um, is it the, s the same algorithm or? Yes, yes, it will be the same, but um, okay, no. Uh, so if you want the, the algorithm still to work, you need to change these coefficients here. Because if you make more gradient steps, you need to make sure that there is enough mixing between the variables, and so you need to accelerate mixing. Okay, okay. But you will obtain up to a time rescaling the same algorithm. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, so here you have uh, convergence rates in expectation. Did you try to have something in terms of high probability? Uh, probably not enough. So no, I cannot control anything else than the expectation. So we did take a look at least in simulation to to see whether uh, there were large deviation from the from the expectation. We didn't see any of this, um, but still it would be interesting to to get any control like um, on the second moment or anything else. But really the magic uh, in the proof, uh, I mean, the, the proof stays similar to nested of proof only if uh, you look at the expectation. Otherwise, I think it would get quite complicated. So in practical optimization algorithms, uh, if we need just to run the algorithm and accelerate it, we could still use nested of. I mean, because this was, as far as I understood, this was proposed to to help with proofs or with the theoretical um, approaches. Yeah, so, so, so what would be the advantage? So, so, so you're asking, uh, in practice, does it bring an advantage? Yeah. So I think that it will work uh, very similarly to a nested of acceleration. At least that's what we see in simulations, and the bounds are, the, roughly speaking, the same. Um, so there is no big practical advantage. It's more like for maybe theor theoretical understanding of uh, what is the high-level intuition be behind uh, acceleration. That was the hope. Uh, another hope but here again, it's a bit more subjective, is that um, this technique could help in other settings where we do, do not know how to do acceleration because things get quite complicated. And maybe this simplifies things enough in order to be able to achieve uh, acceleration in new settings. But this, we do not demonstrate uh, it yet, and so I don't want to have a claim in that direction. And the conditions for nested of acceleration are more or less. I mean, what are they? The, the, the conditions to be able to do nested of acceleration. Like, like the, um, what are the settings of uh, nested of acceleration? In yeah, which I mean, under which uh, context? So I think there are several of them, but uh, in the paper we deal with two, which is the optimi optimization of smooth and new strongly convex function. Mm -hmm. And we also do another version where you remove the strongly convex assumption. So you don't achieve the same rates, of course, but you remove a strongly convex assumption and you wonder, can you accelerate from, I think, uh, 1 over n to 1 over uh, n square, well, 1 over k to 1 over k square. And we do a similar continuized version of this algorithm. OK, thanks. Hi. Uh, so for the proof of the theorem that you have on slide 5, which is very similar to the one that you have here. Um, do you use the same kind of uh, proof technique as for the unintuitive derivation of Nesterov? Yes. Okay. Yes, so it's not very different, um, but here you have a... So what you will use essentially is the memoryless property of the exponential, and then you will show that... Uh, so before, uh, Nesterov used a certain Lyapunov. Now this Lyapunov will be a random quantity, and you, so you have to show that it is decreasing, but as a random quantity, so that it is a super martingale, I think. And so this is what we show, but it's essentially the same proof. So really, it's not very different from a stair of acceleration. 
you might even consider it as a different way to present things, but it's not the same algorithm. It's a bit randomized, but still, it's just another way to see things. Okay, so it's not that uh, you somehow managed to get a good interpretation of Nesterov's weird proof by looking at the continuized. Not really. So I think for me, it helps to understand uh, this iteration, because this iteration, I didn't understand it before. But uh, maybe the, like some people that are stronger in optimization, they, they did. But um, So this was a bit ambiguous for me. And uh, I don't know, deriving it from this helped, basically. Okay, but it's only my perspective, and I don't want to, again, to ever claim the, the use of this. Thanks a lot. So I have a question to the second part with the graphs and computing the average. So you say that uh, to compute the average, you interpret that as doing gradient descent on that energy function. Mm -hmm. And that energy function to me, it's basically connected to something which we call, I don't know, Laplacian of a graph, right? So basically you find the first eigenvector of the Laplacian. Can you somehow use similar techniques to maybe find other eigenvectors? Okay, tough one. So can you accelerate finding eigenvectors of the graph? Something, something like that. I don't know if it makes any sense, but to me it's right. Potentially you have uh, the vector x distributed mm -hmm. in your graph exactly as you had. But now, does it make any sense even? Yeah. I, I mean, don't know, but I saw that connection. I don't know. I no, hope no, maybe I, you. I think for me, it, it makes sense. So computing the average is computing the first eigenvector, which is mm -hmm. constant on the, on the graph. And then you wonder, can I change the update rule to select other eigenvectors? And people have been doing uh, graph algorithms like this, but uh, really I didn't try. So I think this question makes sense, but I, I don't know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think we are our fair share of questions. So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. for being here. Uh, let's enjoy a few more posters. Don't forget to pick up a souvenir mug if you have not done so. And uh, good afternoon. And thank you for, for being here at the Mirror event. <laughs>